Consider your word this afternoon. Teach us, Lord. We want to be like Mary that sits at your feet and learn of you. We will not be anxious over so many things. 
but we learn to rest in your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Sometimes it is a difficult decision to make. Either to go on worshiping, ministering, or the word of God. Alright? Most of you pastors don't experience this. Because it's all set. But in a meeting like this, we have the privilege, the honor, and the flexibility of uh, uh, learning to know how to flow with what the Spirit of God wants to do and want to say. You see, this morning, I missed it. Wow. You see, just before I introduced Rambatu, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord says to pray for the sick. So in my mind, I was thinking, why should I pray for the sick? Rambabu should pray for the sick. You are going to Rambabu to pray for the sick. So I just left it. And God in His ways, you see, to show that what I heard is correct, He started to heal people. You see, if only I yield and obey. Now, hearing God's voice, the moving the gifts takes a lot of guts, takes a lot of boldness, takes a lot of stepping out by faith. Now, I prophesy hundreds of times how many of you have received a prophecy through my ministry? Can I see your hand? Look at that. <laughs> so, most of you know that I do prophesy. But I want to confess something to you tonight, this afternoon. Is I'm very afraid to prophesy. If I had a choice, I would not prophesy. Now, if you see me minister, you say, wow, so cool, so calm, like a cucumber. <laughs> How many of you have seen ducks swimming in the pond? You have seen swan or ducks swimming, especially in Australia. Oh, I love Australia. And New Zealand. And all the Australians say, eh? yeah. But Malaysia is better. Yeah. And Philippines is second. Now, if only you could see beneath the water and the feet of the ducks frantically flapping and trying to keep the whole body afloat. It's a lot of work, a lot of struggle, a lot of energy being released to keep the duck and the swan uh, swimming across the lake or the river. And I like it moving in the gifts of the Spirit like that. It looks so calm outside, but inside, oh Lord, do I miss you? Do I say something that's wrong? Alright? Now this afternoon, I'm going to speak on the gift of prophecy. Everybody say prophecy. prophecy. Come with me to the book of Amos. Chapter 3. How many of you wish that a meeting and conference like this could go on for another one week? Only five. How many of you would like this conference to go on for another one week? Okay, all right, I have uh, enough material on the prophetic to cover for two weeks or, or a month with at least uh, six hours a day. So I have a big task this afternoon to condense one month's material, six hours a day into one hour. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take snapshots of some salient and important points 
And I hope in the process of sharing the gift of prophecy, it will spark off a desire. It will spark off a realm. It will spark off something that each one of us can enter in. Alright? Now, I discovered the Bible is a prophetic book. Everything God does, before He does something, He always speaks it into being. You'll find that truth from Genesis to Revelation. Before God does something, He always prophesies. Let there be light. God prophesied. You can, you can say and substitute what God said into God prophesied. Am I right? And when, when God prophesied, let there be light, it came about. Now Amos 3 verse 7 tells us something very powerful here. The language here is strong. It says, Surely the Lord does nothing wow unless he reveals the secret to his servant the prophets a lion has roared who will not hear the lord god has spoken who can but prophesy now it seems that god decided to limit himself that before he does something he has to declare it. He has to prophesy. He has to call into being. Now faith is connected to prophecy. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now prophecy is like calling those things who do not exist as though they were. Am I right? I prophesy that you're going to go to Australia. You have never been to Australia. You don't know how Australia looks like. So I'm calling that trip, that, that mission trip or whatever trip to Australia into being. And by faith, it will come to pass because God said it. I remember a number of years ago, I was ministering in Jakarta. And I look at a couple in a meeting and I went and prophesied. I said, God, go open the door and, and, and give you a trip to Australia. Now, understand they were wage earners and with their normal income and salary, they, they probably would not go to Australia. Secondly, there is no reason to go to Australia. Thirdly, they don't know anybody in Australia. Did the word of God come to pass? How many wants to know? Yes, the word of God came to pass. They worked for a Christian boss. And one day, this Christian boss, a very wealthy man, sent both husband and wife to Australia to get something done. Hallelujah. Amen. Give Jesus a clap. Now, how do you know what is spoken is prophecy from God? Of course, the test is, does it come to pass? Now, 98% of what God speaks comes to pass. There is 2% that doesn't come to pass. Let me give you some example. When God says, to Jonah to go to Nineveh. He says, prophesy in 40 days time, God's going to judge Nineveh. Do you think that prophecy would come to pass? It would. But because the Ninevites heard it, responded, and they began to repent, guess what? God relented. Right? And that prophetic word seemingly didn't come to pass. It's not that Jonah heard wrongly or it was a false prophecy. But generally, whenever God speaks, it will come to pass. The second example I give you is this. You'll find that seven times God said to the children of Israel, I will bring you to the promised land. How many read that? 
When they came out of Egypt, God says, I will bring you to the promised land. God says, I will, I will, seven times. Now, how many of you know the generation under Moses who received that prophetic word? None of them entered the promised land. None of them see that prophecy come to pass. Only two men did, Joshua and Caleb. Amen. So it is possible that prophetic word from God may not come to pass. However, generally it does. Okay? Now, another aspect about prophecy is this. It stirs you, it comforts you, and it exhorts you. Alright? Prophecy has the power to stir you, to encourage you, and to comfort you with normal times and normal counseling and normal talking does not help. Now, how many of you are pastors and ministers of the gospel? Wave your hand at me. I discovered something interesting. The things that people go through in life some of the things through our normal teaching and counseling and advising and prayer doesn't work. How many of you discovered that? There are some problems and situations that people go through that the normal counseling and teaching of the Word of God doesn't seem to have a breakthrough or, or release that healing or that touch. Actually, some of these cases need the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Let me explain why. That's why I'm so convinced that we need the gifts of the Spirit so badly. I explained the other night that it's the tools. Without the tools, we cannot get the work done. Now, I was ministering in Middle East, one, one, one big church, a church of 3,000 in, in uh, Dubai. And God gave me a word of knowledge. It was not a prophecy, it was a word of knowledge. That there was a lady there, she had abortion twice, some 10 years ago. Now, how many of you know this type of word of knowledge in the Asian culture and the Middle Eastern culture is very hard to respond? <laughs> I mean, it's not something very nice for everybody to know that they have committed abortion twice. But the point was not so much the, the act, of course, the act has the consequences. The point that God wants to bring forward, this woman, he, she did it before she was born again. And of course, after she became a Christian, she repented, she asked God for forgiveness. However, she could not forgive herself and she still carried that guilt even though she was already born again. She still struggled with that guilt. How many know what you have done in the past cannot be undone? But we thank God for the grace, the redemption, the blood of Jesus. So this woman in the Middle Eastern culture would not share probably with their pastors or friends or anybody else. And yet she struggled with this area of guilt. How many know guilt is a terrible thing to struggle? Now the word of knowledge was given and God said to her, I have forgiven you, I have cleansed you. And you should not be carrying that burden of guilt anymore. And in a split second, she was set free. Now, I, would, I didn't give her to respond to the order call because I would not want to embarrass her. And most likely, she would not come out herself. You see, when you learn to move in the gifts of the Spirit, you must understand that it's not just moving on the gifts of the Spirit. You must know how to administer the gift. You must have the wisdom of God how to administer the gift for each situation, each person. Any medical doctors here, can you please wave your hand at me? Alright, there are some doctors here. Now, a doctor does not simply prescribe medication. Because your cold and cough, this is standard cold and cough. No, he examines each patient. And then he prescribes the medication. You have to take the correct dosage. You have to take the right timing. It's antibiotic, you've got to finish the whole course. If it's not antibiotic, it's okay. When you, the fever finishes, you do need to take the fever medicine, you understand? So what I'm trying to say is, it's not only ability to diagnose the problem, but also the ability and the wisdom to administer the correct dosage, the correct proportion, 
the correct way so that the patient can be helped. And how many know if you give the wrong dosage, correct diagnosis, wrong dosage, you can kill him. So, anyway, how do I know this lady's case? The following night I had a meeting. He came out. She was so bold. She came out and testified. Exactly what the word of knowledge said. She was so touched, she was weeping, she was set free. How many know no amount of counseling can set her free? This is what I call the gifts of the Spirit as an operation that God in His divine grace touched somebody and set a person free. Let me give you an example of how prophecy uh, works that touch life in such a deep manner that none other things can. You see, uh, by the grace of God, God used me in this area of prophecy for the last uh, 23 years. And I'm still learning. In, in the year 2003, sorry, the last year, 2004, there is a Bible school in, uh, in Kenya. Now, Ram Babu and, and Pastor Emmy Verghese and Pastor Thomas Chirayan and another Pastor Elias in, in Dubai, we are all connected. So this, this uh, Pastor Ram Babu's pastor, Ram Babu's pastor in, in, in India and my friend in the uh, Middle East, they organize every year uh, uh, Africa Bible School. So in the school, they, they bring 100 to 200 students for about a month and just feed them, they come to the school, we have classes the morning, afternoon and night, and after that one month, they all go to other parts of, of, the, of the village and begin to plant churches. So I, I was one of the teachers there in that school, and Rambabu was also one of the teachers. So when I went to that meeting that day, now, that's a black country. How many been to Africa? And most African have never seen a Malaysian Chinese. <laughs> now I want to give you the context. The first time I went to Africa was in 1984, Kenya, Nairobi. When I first landed at the airport in Nairobi, I was thoroughly shocked. The first shock and the impression I received is all Kenyans look alike. Now, how many of you Chinese have heard that people have said those from other race and other nation have said, we Chinese look alike? How many of you have heard that phrase? Uh, for us, Chinese are so different. <laughs> we be Chinese, we know we are so different. Just like the, the Kenyan among themselves, when they look at one another, though, it's different. Alright? So, understand that cult context where I'm talking. Now, when I first went to the Bible school that morning, the Spirit of God was already moving. So I just flowed with the Spirit of God. And somehow I was drawn to this lady who was seated in the front row. They were all seated, they were all waiting for me to teach the word. But I didn't teach, the Spirit of God was moving. I went and laid hands on her and I called her Mama. I didn't know the people there called her Mama. So I just called her Mama and I began to prophesy that she was going to be a mother hen, that she's going to nourish the young chicks, she's going to impart life and, and it was a long prophecy. The next thing I knew, this lady in her late 40s started kneeling down and started weeping like a baby. Now, I told you the other day that I was just a postman. But I knew that whatever words didn't mean much to me, meant a lot to her. So I was very curious. I wanted to find out how these simple prophets can cause me to sit in a position, into a kneeling position, and weep and weep and weep like a baby, and there was